Well, we're going to call it the uh, school year finale of it. Welcome back for another Big 12 breakdown. John, is it nice to uh, be in summer mode? Uh, summer mode is very nice for me. Let me tell you, um, school school year is great. Nothing like it. But you get to June and July, and I'm home every night and home every weekend. And my wife picks whatever she wants to watch on television. And we go out for nice walks and the sunflowers. How's that sound? So really, really nice and uh, making the most of it. I can't say I blame you. Summer mode has been nice on our end. Uh, you know, last week, the last week of activities at Baylor and in the local high school scene, uh, Nicole Sheeran and I both wound up with a p couple of late nights at the state baseball tournament last week. Uh, we can blame China Spring there. Yeah. Uh, the But this week, you know, we get there and it's like, okay, there's one press conference and I mean, a lot more Rangers and Astros highlights than I'm used to. And so right. uh, one press conference for the week, like that's right. the whole week. That's <laughs> the week. And so it's been, it's been fun, but I'm glad we get to talk about uh, how we're going to wrap up the uh, athletic year here. Yeah. Sounds Let's, good. And you asked, I asked you the other day, you said, Hey, you want to record something? And I said, yeah, what are we going to talk about? So <laughs> you tell me what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Let's start with the history in Oklahoma city. Uh, obviously, Oklahoma did set the NCAA tournament record. We talked about a couple, either the last time we did this or the time before. Um, you know, NCAA consecutive wins in NCAA softball. Uh, they broke the record for the most consecutive wins on their own campus, a, a record held by their football program. And they've now won 53 consecutive games as they achieved the three peat in college softball, three consecutive national championships. Is there a team in college softball we have seen that is as dominant as this Oklahoma team is? Uh, I would say no, in no matter how you measure it. And, uh, you know, I remember the old Pac-12 days, or probably the Pac-10 then, and, and UCLA was just, just, run, just a powerhouse team. And then Arizona was a powerhouse team. And those are the, te the only two teams that have won more national championships now than Oklahoma. But this Oklahoma team, it's different because we've seen them up close. I mean, we've seen them, you know, play in Waco against Baylor. And we've seen them at the Big 12 tournament. And so we've, we're seeing them up close and personal more than just reading about and hearing about those old uh, Pac-10 teams. Right. So this is really amazing. And I think, uh, you know, with what they've accomplished continuing this year, uh, this has to be the most dominant season, most dominant team that has ever played college softball. It, and if it's not, like you said, it's top two up there with those areas. <laughs> yeah, up there with the that Arizona run in the late 90s there. And so, you know, you look at this OU team. I saw a tweet from someone at the USA Today after that, uh, after game two of the champ series last week, like, how good does Baylor feel right now? You're the one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're the one on this yeah. uh, 50 something in one record. Yeah. Um, 60, 61 and one was the final record for, for Oklahoma. And, um, you know, I, I said this going into the, the postseason and then going into the women's college world series, Baylor's going to be at the women's college world series because Oklahoma's there and they're, everybody's going to see their record. And they're going to say, who was that one uh -huh. team <laughs> that knocked off Oklahoma and, Oh, it's Baylor February 19th. So, Quite a feather in Baylor's cap to be the only team that has beaten Oklahoma all season. You know, two Big 12 teams get there to Oklahoma City. Texas falls in the Supers, um, and then uh, Oklahoma State gets there, wins a game, but, you know, drops its first and third games in Oklahoma City. Do you remember the 2015 hmm. college softball season at all? Because that Oklahoma State team, and then you look at it today, four straight women's college world series. These are not the same programs. Yeah. I don't remember 2015. Uh, I thought you were going to say last year, you know, when Oklahoma, Oklahoma state and Texas were really the final three right. teams at the women's college world series. But no, I don't really go back to 2015 that well. So 2015, um, not to uh, date myself in my youth. Uh, I was a junior at Oklahoma state and they fired the, they, they made a coaching change after the season. It didn't go well. Um, yeah. It hadn't gone well for a few years. And so they made a coaching change. 
there's this assistant that nobody outside of the college softball world had ever heard of who was at the Women's College World Series with Florida, who I believe won the national championship that year. And then the next thing you know, we see on Twitter, who's this Kenny Gajewski guy (laughs) that is now the, the new softball coach. And then come to find out, find out it's pronounced completely differently. It's Gajewski. And uh, eight years later, he has not missed an NCAA tournament. He's hosted several regionals, hosted several super regionals, been to four consecutive Women's College World Series, and was one error from playing in the Champ Series against their cross-state rival a year ago. This, and I say that, at I lay that background, to now come back to Oklahoma. Is it? a recoverable loss for the big 12 in softball when Oklahoma goes to the sec because of what OSU has done. You look at last year, three teams in the uh, semifinals in the big, from the big 12 in Oklahoma city. And two of them are going to the sec this year, two teams in in the final eight and two of them are going, and one of them is going to the sec. Um, Is the, is the buildup that Oklahoma state has done for the past eight years almost for lack of a better way of wording it. And I, if you have a better way, I'd love to hear it. Kind of the saving grace for the sport of softball in the big 12. Once July 1st, 2024 rolls around and Texas and OU are now members of the Southeastern conference. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and certainly Oklahoma state has had the, uh, the most success of any other program. I mean, outside of Oklahoma and Texas, the last few years, um, but I think, you know, there's other programs that are good. Baylor's a really good, solid yes. program. Baylor's a good, solid program. And uh, I, I can't say I know that much about the four new schools coming in and their softball, you know, history and, you know, where they might rank or where they might help the power of the Big 12. But I, I think, uh, you know, hey, losing Oklahoma um and texas from the big 12 that's going to be a blow in softball because those two teams have been really really good and really historically good here lately um so that's going to hurt but i think that there are other schools and other programs that have uh bought into uh you know investing in softball in their softball programs to the point that they're going to be nationally competitive also and i agree with you because I didn't think it was, but I'm one person. Um, you know, Houston's got some tradition in softball, and they've been yeah. good, especially in the last few years. And Central Florida beat a ranked team in the first week of the season this past year. And so I, I, I agree with you. There are some teams in the conference now that are already building toward it. I mean, Baylor's young, and Glenn Moore has expanded his recruiting perimeters. He's he's pulling in really star-studded commits from the transfer portal now. Um and you can you can tell they're knocking on the door there. The the Bears are at least to me. Um, the other teams in the conference, yes, Oklahoma State, very good. Houston, UCF, they're going to add to the league. Um, and yeah, you're you're going to have a hard time replacing the dynasty in the sport at the moment. But you have the schools to do it, and the fact that you have a team playing for national championships in these sports that the SEC is good at from the Big Twelve that will be in the big 12 once July 2nd, 2024 gets here. Um, I think it's a good thing for the sport again, tough to replace the school and it's tough to replace, uh, what, what'd you call her? Uh, seven natty Patty. Yeah. Seven natty Patty. Um, <laughs> I, that's not original. That's, <laughs> I don't think I would have gone there unless I heard it somewhere else. Um, and you know, there's, it, it's hard. It's hard to replace the greatest coach in the history of the sport, or one of them. If the, if you want to have a debate for um, a, a couple of other coaches there too, but I do think that it's it, it is worth the conversation of how what is the state of the Big Twelve, and I agree with you. It's a it's a big ding, but you still, if you take OU and Texas out of the equation, the conference still has four straight trips to the final eight in Oklahoma City. It still has teams that have been in the regionals. Uh, you know, Iowa State was there, was it a year ago or two years ago? Um, and so the the conference, I think, will recover. Um, it just might take a minute so that the w- rest of the softball community can look and say, yeah, they're fine. with they're, they're, they're doing the best they can without OU in Texas. Yeah. 
And isn't it funny, you know, we're talking about Texas and OU leaving from a softball perspective, but there's probably, you know, except maybe the softball world, there's very few people who think of it that way. You know, most mm -hmm. people think of Texas and OU leaving the Big 12 for the SEC only in terms of football. But, you know, here's another example, a really good example of another sport that doesn't get as much attention as football, certainly. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a huge, uh, uh, huge loss for the Big 12 and a gain for the SEC with Texas and OU moving in that sport to that league. And, and you're 100 percent right. You know, a lot of football takes up a lot of the oxygen in the room. I can sit here right now and tell you the sports in, in, in different sports and whether I think it's a, a positive, whether I think the league is getting better, worse or a net neutral once OU and Texas are formally members of the SEC in a year from now. Um, but one, we don't have that kind of time. Yeah. Uh, but it is worth the conversation, which brings me to baseball. There is a team that a lot of people, myself included, have said got screwed out of the NCAA tournament, at least when you compare it to other teams in the league, that come July 2nd, 2024, will still be a member of the Big 12 Conference. John, should Kansas State have gotten into the NCAA tournament? Oh my gosh, yes. Unbelievable. I couldn't believe it on, uh, on Selection uh, Monday, I guess it was, when they announced the field. And, and I've got to say, I knew Baylor wasn't going to be in there. Baylor wasn't right. in postseason this year. So I wasn't tuned in as, as closely as I normally would have been. But I think I saw the release from the Big 12, you know, about, uh, what was it, six teams that were in from the Big 12? Six teams in from the Big 12, one that was hosting, five that went el elsewhere. So you had Oklahoma State, yeah. and then you had Texas West Virginia, those two were two seeds in their regionals. Yep. And then your three seeds in regionals were Texas Tech, Oklahoma, and Te um, TCU. TCU. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw that list. And the first thing I thought of was I was surprised that there was only one host, you know, Oklahoma State right. hosting in Stillwater, only one from the league. There's usually multiple host sites from the Big 12. And then it didn't really hit me till later. I said, wait a second, what about Kansas State? You right. know, I think Kansas State was was pretty much a lock where they finished in the league standings and finished ahead of or maybe tied with a couple of teams that got in and Kansas State didn't get it. And it went further in the Big 12 tournament on top of, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, and I'm trying to do this a little bit from memory, which means that I should really pull up the information here. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Kansas State – took the season series from Oklahoma. It went further in the Big 12 tournament than Oklahoma did, and it finished tied with TCU for fourth in the league. Yeah. At 13-11, Oklahoma finished in sole possession of seventh. So yeah. K-State, two games better in the, in the Big 12 on the season. Three more wins. Both of them lost the season series to the last place team in the conference. And I just, so on my podcast shortly after that, I did a blind resume comparison and said, if these are your two teams in the running to be team 64, why in the world did you go with Oklahoma over Kansas state? Just because they went to the champ series a year ago, because I don't think 2022 should count when it comes to who's in a regional in 2023. I agree completely, you know, and uh, a lot of times those blind resumes are very telling. I don't know what it was. I don't know that I ever saw uh, or heard an explanation from the committee or from anyone of why K-State was left out. Did you see anything like that? I didn't. I saw a pretty animated statement um, from Pete Hughes, who, if I'm not mistaken, also used to be coach at OU, didn't he? That's correct, yes. K-State took two out of three from Texas Tech and going back through it, uh, two out of three from Oklahoma. No, I'm sorry, swept Oklahoma mm -hmm. at home. And so I never saw any explanation. I never saw any anything other than that animated statement from Pete Hughes. And then I think Gene Taylor, his athletic director there at K-State, uh, released a statement as well. But that was it from what I saw. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. Uh, I wonder about RPI. Did you ever see RPI? 
I you know, did, but maybe, to... and that's one thing I heard from Pete Hughes was, um, does that factor in? Should that factor in? Because look where they are in Manhattan, Kansas. Who do they have? What are the options they have to play in non-conference? So maybe their RPI might be a little lower just because, you know, there's not any real good uh, top RPI teams available in non-conference. That is true. So Oklahoma is 40th in the RPI. Okay. And Kansas State is 54th in the okay. RPI. Okay. Um, when you look at road record, K-State is 14 and 11. Oklahoma is 13 and 10. So both of them are three games above 500. Right. Um, and OU is a little bit ahead of them in the RPI. Um, and, you know, you can make these RPI arguments uh, for some other points in the NCAA baseball tournament as well. Kendall Rogers at D1 Baseball said that this is the bracket that is going to get RPI reform pushed through in the, at the NCAA level because yeah. there are coaches who are mad about it, and rightfully so. I mean, there were yeah. some perplexities uh, in this year's field. Had a conversation with a buddy of mine who um, – I respect and who follows college baseball closer than anybody I know who told me, I don't understand why South Carolina is hosting. Mm. And I thought it was a valid point. And then South Carolina goes and wins its regional. And so yeah. egg on my face at that point, but <laughs> right. um, it's, it's an interesting bracket because like you said, normally multiple hosts from the big 12, and yet somehow this year we were talking about is the big, you know, the whole conversation from guys like Clay Matvik uh, during the Big 12 tournament was, is the Big 12 going to get a host? Because I don't think it's going to get two, not unless your championship game winds up being like Texas and Oklahoma State. And it wasn't. Um, and so interesting year. And, you know, there was a lot more parity in the Big 12. You also don't normally see a tri-champ situation. Right, right. And so I think that hurt it a little bit in the RPI. Um, and definitely when it comes to hosting, because typically your top 16 RPI spots are your, your 16 host sites. Yeah. Um, it was just interesting to me. And I think if I'm the big 12, I would rather have the team to finish three games up and swept, um, team B in the, in, in the regional, because to me, that gives me a better, sh a better competitive shot at a super regional, um, you know, there were people saying Texas Tech didn't belong this year. Not That's a different conversation for a different time. Um, and you could make that argument and probably had, have some valid points on it. But then they went and they went the full seven games. They came out of the winner's bracket in the Gainesville Regional before getting edged uh, by a team that's now in Omaha. Yeah. Were you surprised that the team of the Big 12 teams, the six of them in the regional, the one that went 0-2, was the one host? Yeah, very much so. I, I did look at that regional when it was announced and thought, man, that's a tough regional. Oh, brutal. And those are some tough teams that are there. And you consider uh, Oklahoma State hosting, Dallas Baptist was there, Oral Roberts, which eventually came out as the, you know, the winner of that regional, and then who Washington, I think, was the fourth team there. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a, a tough regional from the get-go. But I thought, you know, for Oklahoma State, uh, you know, playing at home, come on. I was really surprised when they went over and two. I was floored. I, yeah. I was truly floored by it. Um, I've seen Oklahoma State kind of disappoint is the way that I'll word it in home regionals before. My junior, my freshman and junior year. So I, I was only in school for three years. I graduated a year early. Um, and for financial aid, they did freshman, junior, senior. So that way, the, that way everybody understands when I, when I say the timeline, my first two years yeah. at Oklahoma state, my freshman and junior year, OSU hosted a regional, my freshman year, OSU was the 16 and top overall Oregon state got beat in its home regional. So UC Irvine advances OSU hosts a super. Yeah. Errors get the best of it. Irvine rests its ace in game one. They have him ready for game two. So really, if you're going to, and their ace, I think, was like national pitcher of the year that year. Yeah. He was so good. OSU then loses uh, game one with a bunch of errors, then has to face one of the best pitchers in college baseball, loses game two. So because OSU knew its roadmap was one and three because you're probably not beating Irvine's ace that year. Yeah. Um. Then my junior year, 
OSU hosts another regional. Arkansas, St. John's, um, and I think Nebraska were in Stillwater for it. And Oklahoma State's only win came against St. John's, who stole a bid from, I don't even remember who the best team in the Big East was that year, because this is when UConn was still in the American. Wow. And so its only win was against St. John's in an elimination game. When 0-2, Arkansas wins the regional. So my senior year, I graduate. I've now covered the team for two years, three years, actually. I did it all through school. I knew some of the players at this point. They don't host a regional. They go to, I want to say, South Carolina, win that regional, go to Clemson for the Super Regional, win it in three, I believe, and then go to Omaha. I don't think they went back to Stillwater at any point during that summer. Wow. But getting away from Stillwater seemed to be kind of the roadmap to success. Since then, if I'm not the only host, they've hosted three regionals since I left. They've been in it every year, um, but sometimes they're a regional too, or they, and they might have even hosted it more. They'll go six, seven games in the regional. They'll go to that regional final, but the only time they've gotten out of it since then was 2019, and they had to move it from Alley P. Reynolds Stadium, what was supposed to be the farewell tour for that stadium, the historic good they replaced it stadium in Stillwater, and played it in Oklahoma City because severe weather moved through and flooded the field in Stillwater. So they had to move it to the AAA park in OKC and play the regional there um, because the Oklahoma City Dodgers were out of town on that weekend. And so they won that regional. They go to the Super Regional against Texas Tech. They go the full three. Tech goes to Omaha. That was the 8-9 pairing. Um, and I remember Matt Roberts, your, your colleague there at Baylor, he and I were, he's a Texas tech grad and he and I were texting the whole time during that series. So Oklahoma state has disappointed in regionals before, but never, not since it was the eight seed that snuck into the big 12 tournament and then pulled all kinds of upsets and won the big 12 tournament in 2017, 2018, never has OSU gone two and Q in an NCAA regional in my recollection. Josh Holiday's first year, 2013, they go to the re- a Game 7 regional final against Louisville. This was – this disappointment in the regional has a certain segment of that fan base now calling for some sort of change in the coach's office, whether it's if, if Holiday won't part with Walton or uh, then maybe it's time to clean house or at least it's time to change pitching coaches because pitching is what did them in. Uh, This year, it's what did them in a year ago, combined with MCC alum Jalen Battles just hitting one over the right field wall that still has not landed yet. Um, And so I'm not saying I agree with them. I'm saying that this is what the segment of the fan base is saying. It's an when you have a host that peters out that quickly, it does change the way people look at the conference. That's why I'm talking at length about it, at least to me. Um, and then, you know, you should be, the idea is if you look at where the bracket puts you, you should be in a super regional. OSU would not have hosted a super regional. Couldn't you, uh, actually, no, it would have. Because Oregon won the, uh, the Fayette, right. uh, Oregon won its region. And that's where it got paired. So you missed out on a home super regional and you missed out on, if you look at matchups, likely a shot at Omaha, but OSU also every year, if you look at schedules, sometimes familiarity can do wonders for teams, no matter what happens in the regular season. Since I've started following college baseball, my freshman year at Oklahoma state, OSU has played Dallas Baptist twice a year. It has played Oral Roberts home and home every year. And those two were in its regional, and those are the teams that beat it. Yep. I think that was a factor, that familiarity. I mean, those teams, uh, DBU and ORU, they go in there, and it's not like they're awestruck. You know, they've played there before, probably won there before. In fact, I'm sure they have. So yeah. it was, that, that made it a tough draw for Oklahoma State to get those schools that aren't going to be wide-eyed, you know, coming into O'Brake Stadium. I whole, wholeheartedly agree with you that that was a factor. Elsewhere in the Big 12, Texas Tech goes to a Game 7 regional winner-take-all um, against Florida before the Gators just kind of did what they have done all year 
at that point. Um, Texas wins its regional in Miami, goes 3-0 and in yeah, its regional. And so it won its first four games in the NCAA tournament. Do we need to talk about how good Stanford is in elimination games right now? <laughs> what We need to talk about either the twilight or the lights at the sunken diamond. Yep. Um, because that was a factor in Texas losing. And it was apparently a factor in the regional. Didn't Texas A&M have some issues uh, losing balls in the lights out there? Everybody who goes to Stanford has issues with the lights. Um, yeah, A&M, I think, dropped a, a routine pop-up like that as well. Um, the lights are different at Sunken Diamond. Um, I don't, I haven't been to that field, and so I'm not 100% sure on why. Um, but I do know that it, it that diamond is a part of why Stanford is right now the best program in the Pac-12 conference. Um, they, man, that play was so brutal. Stanford... Okay, if you haven't seen Texas, how it how Stanford walked off Texas in game three of the Super Regional, you got to go to Twitter. It is the most – you just – you can't help but feel bad for Longhorn fans after right. it. It's right. a brutal play to watch. Um, it was like an Angels in the outfield meets just routine pop-up. And so – but Stanford, 5-0 and oh, – no, 4-0 and oh, rather, in elimination games this really? season. 4-0. No, five. It is five, and I did my math wrong. Stanford goes to the 1-0 and game in its own regional, faces Texas A&M, loses, wins its elimination game the next day, beats Texas A&M, forces a winner-take-all game seven regional final, beats Texas A&M again. So that's 3-0 and in elimination games in its own regional. Goes to the Super Regional, drops game one, wins games two and three, facing elimination. Texas... 0 oh, and one in elimination in facing elimination this season. Um, so Stanford just red hot at the moment. Uh, yeah. The other, the other teams from the big 12 that made it Oklahoma wins its first elimination game uh, drops its other two in its regional up in Charlottesville, uh, West Virginia went same thing wins its first elimination game drops its other two uh, kind of got dominated by a really good Kentucky team. Um, West Virginia did. And then TCU, Three and zero in Fayetteville. Who knew? Yeah. yeah, Fayetteville against the Razorbacks, and that place. Uh, you, those fans are rabid there in every uh -huh. sport, but in baseball, man, they really fill it up. And uh, what was Arkansas like? The number three yeah. national seed, maybe they, they were the number three national seed. Yeah, yeah. And they they got. I mean, TCU swept the regional. Man, they went full Texas. <laughs> They scored a bunch of runs in the process, including a 20 to five win in game two of that series. Yeah. And then uh, TCU sweeps a super regional from an Indiana state team that had to play in Fort Worth because they didn't have the infrastructure in place because they had special Olympics, Indiana on the Indiana state campus. So they had to say, we can't host. And they went to Fort Worth horn frogs sweep it. And I mean, one of those was pretty handed. Uh, was a pretty handled uh, win. The other one was pretty close, honestly. Yeah, so one and then six to four were those two games. Now the bright light story out of that was uh, college baseball fans and TCU baseball fans uh, donated. The last number I heard was like twenty three thousand dollars to the Special Olympics of Indiana, so, which is awesome. Uh, that that's tough for Indiana State to win a regional and be in position to host, and you have to say no to it. So uh, TCU got a break there. Really did, and then took advantage of it, which is the whole point of baseball. So TCU, the only Big 12 team in the co Men's College World Series, as time's winding down for us here. Um, they're in bracket one with number two, Florida, number seven, Virginia, and Oral Roberts. So Oral Bobby there uh, in Omaha. And then uh, bracket two is number one, Wake Forest, number five, LSU, number eight, Stanford, and unseeded Tennessee, which won the Hattiesburg Super Regional in three games. TCU is as hot as anybody. And I think if you're talking about teams that are going to make it to the champ series, the conversation has to start with, can anyone cool TCU off? Because so far in the postseason, nobody's been able to do it. They swept yeah. through the Big 12 tournament. They swept through the regional. And they swept through the super regional. Nobody's been able to touch them. And this is a team that with two weeks left in the regular season was barely in the Big 12 tournament field. Yeah. 
Exactly. Uh, but remember, pick to win the Big 12 in the preseason poll, TCU was, and, you know, didn't have a very good regular season, and right. they were on life support and got uh, got hot at the exact right time since the 1st of May. They're 19-2, and two, and they've won 11 straight now going to the College World Series. So no team has a longer winning streak than TCU going to Omaha. You can say the same about Oral Roberts, but I think TCU has better pedigree there. To me, bracket one is between Florida and TCU, you know, one of the two best teams in the country the whole season and the hottest team in the country right now. Yeah. Florida's the number two seed, right? Overall, yeah. behind only uh, Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, so give me, uh, I, I think Florida has the edge, but man, I, if you told me TCU's in the champ series, it doesn't shock me at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as hot as they are, and you know the talent's there, um, and they're just hitting really, really well. Trey Richardson's playing well. Baylor transfer um, had that 11 RBI game in Fayetteville. Right. So, I mean, and it's not just him. Uh, Silva, the freshman shortstop, has been playing really, really well also. So, TCU is a team that is very capable. I mean, they've got the talent. And really, I mean, they haven't been to Omaha since 2017. So none of these guys have been there, but uh, pretty good history in Omaha. This is the sixth time, right? Sixth time they've been since I think 2010. So. Yeah, I think so. And uh, the fifth time in that, if that number is true, which I think it is, that they have gone as the member of the Big 12. At one okay. point, they went like three or four years in a row. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, four years in a row. Okay, so we both think TCU goes pretty far. You have It sounds like you have them in the champ series. I think so. I mean, Florida's good. I, I can't say that I know every nuance of the Florida baseball team, but, uh, you know, they're number, number two national seed for a reason. Right. So that'll be fun to watch. But every team that's there is good. You know, yeah. every team that, that is there. And, and are we sliding ORU here? Now, ORU is a team that led the nation in fielding percentage this year. They're like sixth in team batting average. Seems like a very well-rounded team. And, uh, you know, TCU's got to get past them in the first mm -hmm. game of the World Series on Friday at 1. I, I think this is a – this could be the chalkiest men's college World Series I've ever seen. This could also be the most upset-laden that oh, I've ever seen. There's right. not really any in-between with this. It is worth noting in bracket two, Wake Forest, good Lord, 22-5 yeah. exactly. to five in game two over Alabama when Alabama yeah. – was um the the number the the home team so they did this all knowing they had to go get three outs in the bottom half uh wake forest won every has won four of its five games this ncaa tournament by double digits 12 nothing 21 6 15 1 and then they had a one run win in the opener of the super regional 5 4 over bama and then 22 to 5 yeah so i think it's i think bracket two is wake forest to lose I do too. Uh, and again, I've just kind of kept an eye on them as they moved up the polls this year mm -hmm. and got to number one and stayed there and number one overall national seed. 50, what are they sitting at? 51 wins, maybe 52 wins. Yeah. Going into the College World Series. Something outrageous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Common opponents. Have, have you looked at who uh, Baylor has a common opponent with, with Wake Forest? I uh, know. Who's that? Youngstown Duke? State. Oh, Youngstown aside, State. Aside from Duke, yeah. Youngstown State opened its season uh, at Wake Forest in a, like, three-team little tournament there. Uh, it was Youngstown State. I want to say it was Illinois and Wake Forest. Interesting. Um, and so a couple of common opponents for the Bears. And uh, let's not leave out Duke, um, who went three games in the Super Regionals with uh, number seven, Virginia. Yeah, yeah, they that turned out to be a good team. I mean, they mm -hmm. put it on Baylor early in the year when the Bears went up there, but that that turned out to be a really good team this year. Two minutes left on the Zoom recording, my friend. Any plans this summer? You know, uh, the best thing for us is just being home at night and home every weekend, and we got a trip to Rockport down to the coast, uh, 4th of July week. Um, I've got a brother-in-law that, that he doesn't live there, but they've got a place there and he could be a full-time fishing guide. I mean, he's that good. Wow. So he takes us out and he wants us to all catch fish and we do, we don't come back. <laughs> in 
so that'll be fun. So we're going down there uh, and then just being around home is pretty nice. That's fun. That's a really fun time. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do, uh, we're going to Puerto Vallarta with my wife's family, nice. uh, nieces included. So I've got just, a, I think they're about to turn two. I hope she doesn't see this. Yeah, I think they're about to turn two, two-year-old yeah. twin nieces. Um, so we'll go to Puerto Vallarta for a few days. We're going to Chicago for our anniversary. My first anniversary is this Saturday. So I haven't messed anything up yet. Um, <laughs> and so we're going to delay it a little bit, go to Chicago for our anniversary, go to a Cubs game, and nice. uh, we made reservations at Gibson's, the famous steakhouse there. Yeah. And then we're going to go. My brother only has a week off. He's doing research at medical school right now. He has a week off right before the fall semester begins in July for him. So we're going to go to Seattle for a few days and just kind of oh, sightsee nice. and see if I can't talk my mom into into a Mariners game. Very cool. You're going to see the sights this summer. Then. Oh, yeah. It's a busy summer, but I'm excited. My very man, cool. this has been fun. I appreciate it, John. I appreciate you. Thank you very much, Curtis. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you later this fall.